Good morning. Good morning. My pleasure to join with you as we continue in our sermon series on miraculous births. I have a true story to tell you here. A fellow, he was going into court, he had a day in court, and he was going as pro se defendant. If you're unfamiliar with the legal and Latin and Greek and all that terms, pro se defendant means that you are uh, denying legal counsel and you're deciding to defend yourself. Okay, For whatever reason, you're going to go in and you're going to defend yourself in this trial. This fellow was going as a pro se defendant into the courtroom, the bailiff, doing a good job, doing his job. He wants to make sure he directs everyone where they go. Remember, true story, he goes to the guy and he asks him the question, are you a defendant or are you a plaintiff? I'm a Baptist, the fellow says. And you know, i got to appreciate your religious zeal right there, but I'm a little concerned about your legal defense at this point, right? Now that guy was strongly raised probably in the Baptist tradition, and we have a lot of good traditions, don't we? And some of those traditions, bless their heart, but you know, they'll say that we'll trace ourselves back to whom in the scripture? The only guy with that name? John the Baptist, right? And you know, you can make an argument, I suppose. Uh, but as far as anachronistically claiming that he was the very first Baptist, I don't know. If, I mean, that's a bit of a no, but... In many ways, a yes, still, because when we look at him, what was he? He had a, a religious zeal for righteousness. Okay, he believed in the repentance of sins. He spoke the truth, whether people liked it or not, and a lot of people didn't like him. So, yeah, that sounds like a Baptist to me, right? John the Baptist, our next miraculous birth, who had an awesome story, an amazing origin story, which will seem a little bit familiar now that we're further along in the sermon series. You'll be able to see the familiarity of these, these themes, these notes, as we bring another special child, another chosen child, into the story of God's plan for the world. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke. You see, many people had special births, and when they had a special birth, that meant that they had a special purpose and calling from God to do an amazing thing. The amazing thing that John has going for him is that his birth, even his birth itself, is all going to be to harbinger the coming of Messiah. Everything that he does and everything that is about him is going to be pointing to his cousin, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Luke chapter 1, beginning with verses 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. All right, we're going to just skip right past where it says advanced in years. Um, no, thank you for that language. Uh, but what we have here is a very familiar story, don't we? We have the same story that we've seen before. We have a righteous man who has a righteous wife, and they are blameless in the ways of the Lord. And yet they are old and advanced in years, and they have no child. Barrenness has been their affliction, their struggle, and their pain. Yet, despite all that, they have still given their heart and their lives to the Lord. We have seen this happen time and time again. We have seen a situation where they are barren and they can't have a child. And as we discussed in Sunday school this morning with the kids, what does God do with the word can't? Oh, he loves the word can't. He loves to take our can't. He loves to drop the T off of it and demonstrate to you what God can do. We serve and worship the God of the impossible. And if you don't believe that, you're wasting your prayers. Because God can take your can't be done. God can take your no way out. God can take your impossible, unconquerable problem and conquer it. That his glory would be known. And your faith and the faith of those who see it can be grown. Amen? A barren woman... Two people advanced in years, no child. All right, now let's jump to the next portion. We're going to read verses 8 through 17. Now while he was serving his priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. 
But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's a lot. All right, first thing we see is Zechariah is a priest. He is already serving the Lord. He's been serving the Lord his whole life. He's been fulfilling his inherited duty before God. Chosen by lot, which means he was chosen by God to be in the, the temple at that time for when God would send an angel before him. And what does Zechariah do? Well, what everyone does whenever they see an angel. He's gripped with fear. When we see these paintings of, of really pretty, uh, effeminate, long-haired, beautiful robes, halo, wings, and harps, that is what I like to call artistic license, or more accurately described as wrong. <laughs> Angels are fearsome dudes. Every time they show up, one of two things happen. They have to say, fear not, or they give you a reason to be afraid. Angels, sometimes they glow. Sometimes their countenance is a fire. Sometimes wings, sometimes not. Sometimes they're packing swords on fire. You never know which kind you're going to get, but you do know when you see suddenly appearing something otherworldly, something distinct, something that is clearly touched by righteousness, we are all of us always gripped with fear. When we encounter the divine, the natural response of a sinful people fear. And the loving response of God and his messengers is to take our fear away. Because God is coming not with a reason to be afraid. You know what is that old adage, if you don't stop crying, I'll give you a reason to cry? God is coming with a reason <coughs> to rejoice. To show his love. And to give to his righteous servant Zechariah a great and awesome promise. He is blessed because he is told that his prayers have been heard. And as we discussed last week with Hannah, that's when the joy comes, when you know your prayer has been heard. Don't wait for the answer to come. Once you know your prayer is heard, receive fully the joy of God in your life because he has it and he has you. And the angel is promising him, not only have your prayers been heard, but they will be answered. You will have a child. You will have a son. And he will have a name that God has chosen. God himself is naming the child that you will have by your life. You will call him John. And moreover, not only will you have a son and a child, but he will be special. He will do something amazing. Joy will come as a result of this child. He will bring the children of Israel, though they are lost, back to the Father in heaven. He will give wisdom to those who need to hear it. And he will prepare the way for God. That's pretty awesome, if you ask me. It's a heavy weight to play on the, the shoulders of a child that hasn't yet been born, hasn't yet been conceived. But when God paves the way for an impossible child to come, he always uses that child amazing things. And all the promises that are laid now before Zechariah, before he can even say a word, as the angel just shows up and leaves his fears and then gives him joy after joy, after promise, after love, after wonderful gifts, and it's overwhelming because the God of abundance does not give us meager things. He gives us amazing things because he only ever does amazing things and makes us amazingly so that we can have an amazing purpose. And amazingly, this purpose is to prepare the way for God. You see, I told you this is going to sound familiar, a lot of familiar things. Old, barren, righteous, and a child is coming. We have seen it happen so many times before. Not only that, this child has a special purpose before his birth. This child, if you notice when he said no strong drink and no wine, but that he's being called to be a Nazarite from birth, and we've seen that before. In fact, we've seen it the last three Sundays by now, haven't we? We saw Samuel, who was called to be a Nazarite from birth. We saw the Samson, who was called to be a Nazarite from birth. And in all three of the stories, they had what a righteous father and a righteous
righteous mother who were old and barren and had no children, and yet God gave them a child, and look what God did with each of those children. So we're seeing the pattern manifest again. But all of this is to prepare the way to remind the people, because let me give you some context of the New Testament. It's been centuries, roughly four or five centuries of silence since the end of the Old Testament, since the last time there was a prophet amongst the people who could speak the word of God, since the word of God itself, the voice of God was directly heard by man. Centuries have gone by, and we haven't heard any of it, and now comes the angel, now comes the promise, now comes the greatness, like all of the stories of old, like we'd seen before. Like everything we were raised to believe and know and cherish. And God is returning to us. And God is preparing for us to do something amazing. Because God is coming for us just as He always did. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Oh, Zechariah. He knows the stories. This isn't just a guy. This is a priest in the service of the Lord. He knows the stories of Abraham. He knows the stories of Samuel and Samson. And yet, and yet he allows his mundane earthly circumstances. He allows the problem and the pain that he has carried all these decades. He allows the problem that he has brought to God time and time again, asking for a solution. And the solution comes. And he speaks and only doubt and disbelief comes from his mouth. <coughs> and on account of that, the angel says in verse 19, and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Well, his mouth got him into trouble, didn't it? That's not an unfamiliar circumstance for, I think, anyone living. Well, as James writes, that the tongue sets the whole world on fire, and boy, does it. See, all this time, the angel Gabriel, he comes and he's speaking promises. He's speaking prophecy. He's speaking the goodness of God. He's speaking the answered prayer. The very thing that Zechariah wanted, and even more, and when Zechariah gets a chance to speak, he steps wrong, he says the wrong thing, he expresses his doubt. So for Zechariah's benefit, God will silence him so he can't say the wrong thing anymore. All right? Until these things come to pass. And what I love about that is Gabriel's making something abundantly <coughs> clear. Though you said the wrong thing, though you expressed doubt, though you believe can't applies to God, though you must be punished, God's still going to bless you. God is not going to revoke those promises and take them from you because the promises of God are not based upon us or what we do or even what we believe. They are based upon the righteousness of our giving God. And because he continues to give despite in many ways because of the disbelief, to prove how wrong you were to disbelieve it, the promises still will be fulfilled, Zechariah, whether you believe it or not. Because the promises, by the way, Zechariah, are bigger than you. And have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought that the blessings coming to you from God are bigger than you? And the blessings that God gives to us of salvation, of redemption, of eternal life are for more than just us. And it's about more than just us. It's about the people who can see the miracle so they can have it too. So yes, am I a sinner? Yes. Do I deserve salvation? No. Am I giving it? Praise God, yes. Because God is good, and the whole world needs to know it. So maybe when you are saved and transformed, and you think, why me? I don't deserve it. Well, you're right. But God is so good that He's not going to stop at you, and He's not going to stop with you. So you share the impossible, unbelievable transformation of your can't to salvation so others can receive it too. Amen. So the blessing can still be fulfilled and the promise known and we can know that God always keeps His promises. It continues to verse 21. 
And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple, and when he came out, he was unable to speak to him, them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. All right, something strange and wonderful happened. God was there. And I appreciate that they recognize it immediately. Too often we see skepticism in the people who should least have it. Too often someone starts to share with you, oh, you're a Christian, let me tell you this wonderful thing that happened where I encountered an angel or a miracle transforms me. And too often believers are skeptical of the story. And they take it with a grain of salt. The first people who should believe that God miraculously intervened in someone's life is a believer in Jesus Christ. Because after all, that's the whole point, beloved. That's the whole point. Unfortunately, these priests believed, they assumed they were right, they saw it, they saw the signs of it as he tried to speak to them with sign language that hadn't yet been invented. But he's playing charades in order to get them to understand the wonderful thing that happened to him. Verse 24, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. And Elizabeth, I understand. I don't think it's a, it's a matter of doubt in this case, where she has conceived and she has a child. I, I think with Elizabeth, it, it, it's fear. I think anyone who has had struggles with fertility, anyone who likely had miscarriages, anyone who had an issue with it, well, you kind of play it close to the best, don't you? Until you've come to term a little bit further along and you feel a little bit more confident. Because you don't want to share a joy that you have to take away. You don't want to share a pain you don't have to. And after five months of God continually every single day, every single day for 150 days, growing and forming fearfully and wonderfully, making this child of his in Elizabeth's womb, she grew in more confident in her faith and in the promise of God to declare that God was taking her can't away to give her a job. And in this way, God is preparing the way for his son to come through John. John hasn't yet drawn a breath, but his whole existence at this point is to remind people of the miraculous purposes and power of God. That God can make the barren to have a child. So if nothing is impossible with God, he can do something even more wonderful and even more miraculous when you begin to hear the tales of an even more miraculous, even more impossible, even more can't birth to come in six months. Well, did God not just remind us that he is the author of life and he can do anything? Amen. Before he is born, he is already preparing the way for his cousin to come. After all, that was his mission. Isn't that exactly what Gabriel said in Luke 1, 17? To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Well, John is born. And John gets to work. John serves the Lord his whole life as he is called to do. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 3 beginning with verses 1 through 6. It says, in those days, this is decades later, John has grown up. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan was going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. This is why I'm most convinced that John the Baptist can be held within the ranks of our denomination because he was a weird dude. He's walking around in weird clothes made out of camel's hair and a leather belt. He's walking around eating grasshoppers dipped in honey. And he's hanging out in the wilderness <coughs> and being absolutely what no one would expect. And yet, what does he give? A message counter to the rigidity of the legalism of the Pharisees saying, you can repent your sins. By the way, take the can out of that conversation. You need to repent your sins. But it's possible. 
God can do the impossible, and God can forgive you. I am living proof that God can do the impossible. Come to the waters. Come to the waters and come to God and see what He has for you. Repent of your sins and believe. He was what was fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 43, this verse, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make His path straight. This is the purpose, the meaning of life for John the Baptist. Prepare the way. And the commentary, when it talks about Isaiah 43, what it's talking about is prepare the way of the Lord. It's talking about how we're in, in a, a, a wilderness, a, a desert, an area devoid of life. But God is going to take that barren land and He's going to fill it with life. And in that, it's going to be a highway, a straight and smooth path, the straight and narrow path that you're supposed to deviate neither to the left nor the right, that you can come to the Lord. And just as He took Elizabeth's barrenness and brought life to it, John the Baptist is reminding us that God will take our barren lives, our cold, legalist, religious, but no relationship lives. And he is going to inject us with the living presence of God himself, the author and finisher of our faith. Because that's what God does. And who didn't like it? The Pharisees. Why? Well, because they're all about that cold religion. They're all about that rigidity and that legalism. They're all about you're a sinner and you're done. And John is saying, you're a sinner too, by the way. You are all sinners. But God can make us clean. We need Him to make us clean. We can't do it. He can. And as John is getting quite the following, he makes it abundantly clear that it is not about John. It is not about John. It's about God. The God that he has been preparing, the highway preparing the people all his life. It is not about him. It's about the glory. John 3, if we skip down to verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Lest you think I'm important. Lest you think that I am mighty and righteous. Lest you think you need me. Or the waters of the river Jordan. John is preaching. There's someone coming after me. Messiah is coming. I baptize you with water. But the Spirit and fire are the means that He is going to baptize you with. Now this is very important. We need to understand something. Earlier on when he was talking about his birth, when, when Gabriel was presaging the coming of John, he said he would come in the Spirit and the power of Elijah. Elijah, who did not die, one of the greatest prophets, whom God took up bodily into heaven. He sent a chariot of fire to scoop him up, and with that UFO, he went into the hereafter. And because of that, a great deal of tradition since then has been waiting anxiously for the return of Elijah, because they believe that Elijah must return first. And when Elijah comes back, he will then prepare the way for who? Messiah. And so they have been waiting anxiously for Elijah's return. Yeah, some people have been looking for Messiah, but honestly, they've been looking for Elijah more than anything. Because when Elijah comes back, then we can start looking for Messiah. You understand why everybody missed the boat in Bethlehem on Christmas night. I mean, it's on the calendar, right? It's clearly marked. <laughs> you see, they're waiting for Elijah. But God wasn't sending Elijah, not yet. Elijah will come on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he's sitting in the spirit of Elijah. See, when Elijah went up before he departed, he gave to Elisha, his sidekick, a double portion of the spirit. So that Elisha was actually able to do even greater miracles than Elijah did. And that same spirit, well, of course it was on John. And Gabriel told us it would be on him from birth. It's the Holy Spirit. I got news for you, beloved. The spirit of Elijah, the double portion that Elisha had, the spirit that of Elijah that was in John the Baptist to come and make way for Messiah is the same Holy Spirit that God has placed in you the moment you say, yes, Lord. And you have the same power and authority to go out into the world and to prepare a highway for our God. We are called, beloved, to share the glory of God. Not about me, not about you, not about us. All glory be to God. Amen. I can't even carry a 
his sandals. Some of my gospel say, I can't even untie his shoes. That's slave work, by the way. I'm not worthy to be a slave. We are not worthy to be a slave of God, and yet somehow, miraculously, not are we called to be the servants of God. We are called to be the sons of God, princes of eternity with God. By the power and loving kindness of the God who says, fear not. And what do we have here? A humble man who is dedicating all of his ministry in preparation for another. Back in 1956, a group of Finns decided they were going to give someone a really good Christmas gift. They had been scrimping and saving all year round to provide their friend with an entire year's salary. Why? Because they believed in her. They knew that she was a great writer and they knew great things were coming. So they gave her an entire year's salary so she could take an entire year off of work so she could write. And Harper Lee used that year to write To Kill a Mockingbird. Published in 1960, it has since sold 30 million copies. Not to mention standard reading in most high schools, or at least it was when I was. I don't know if they're doing that. Why? Because they believed, they saw in her great things. They knew she could do great things. They knew they could do great things themselves, but they could do something to enable her to do something great. So what did they do? They spent a year preparing so that she could have a year to work. They prepared the way for her to do something that touched the world, that touched them. And we don't know their names. Even when I read the story, I didn't tell their names. This is not about them, and it never was about them. It was about them doing everything that they could to help Harper Lee. That is what it means to humbly prepare the way. Because it's not about you. It's about you needing to step aside for the Lord. We're going to now jump to another gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 3. See, John the Baptist, he had a great following. He was touching the people. He was moving things. He was a rock star. If he was born at any other time, there would probably be a book about John the Baptist. I mean, Samuel, he got two books. He wasn't even alive in the second. <laughs> Can you imagine the amount of stories, the amazing things that John the Baptist would have accomplished if he were born at literally any other time? But he was born just six months. Six month head start on Jesus Christ. And he spent... Three decades, his entire life, preparing the way for his cousin. It says in John chapter 3, verse 25 through 30. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. <coughs> John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hearing him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase but I must decrease. And that, that is an amazing act of humbleness. John has spent 30 years preparing the way. John has worked. He has suffered. He has toiled. He has fought for someone else's glory. And as he prepared the way, and he did his job well, because guess what? Jesus hits the ground running. He prepared the way because Jesus Christ is going to have three years of ministry to live out the gospel before he dies for the gospel. That's only a thousand and ninety-five days of teaching to get people to understand what this means. So three decades before that, John is preparing the people, preparing their hearts for an understanding for the need of repentance, for the possibility of repentance, for whom you get repentance from so that Jesus can hit the ground running and run full force Full speed, uninhibited, because the groundwork has all been laid. And guess what? The job is done. Jesus is introduced. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And everyone is going to Jesus. And he has less and less disciples. Jesus' first disciples came from John. 
and less and less and less. And people are talking less and less about John. And John is yesterday's news. Yeah, he was headliner in the newspapers, but now the rapid fish in yesterday's headlines, right? And it would be so easy, so human to regret that, begrudge that. To win. Can I just have a little something? Don't remember, I'm the one that did this. I'm the one that held, I, I, you owe me. And we don't hear a lick of that from John. Any other time, and he would have been the greatest prophet of his era, the greatest prophet literally in 400 years. Instead, no regret, no remorse, no begrudging. His joy is complete. He gets to step aside. And that he is overlooked means he did his job well, my good and faithful servant. Because when I decrease, he says, that means that all of the attention, the honor, and the glory is going where it always should be. I am so glad people get to see Jesus for who he is. Because I have Tell people the Messiah. And in the spirit of Elijah, he came to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And now that the bridegroom is here, the friend of the bridegroom, the best man steps aside because it's not about him. It's about him. Humbleness. Power and humbleness. Not in the world today, oh my goodness, no. World today. Uh, we put narcissists in charge, don't we? The arrogant get all the press and attention. Pride, which is a sin, by the way, gets celebrated for a month. But humbleness is where true, true honor is. Humbleness. Because it's not about me. I serve not for me. I serve for something bigger than me. When a hermit crab comes along the beach and he finds a shell bigger than him, well, he investigates it, and he kind of crabs all around it on his <laughs> Looks at it and sees if it's good, and if it's too big for him, you know what he does? He stands beside it, posts right there. He waits up to eight hours for other hermit crabs to come by and check out that shell, and they see if it's good for them or not. And if it's not, well, guess what? They all start queuing up, and then now you have a line of crabs, orderly, I might add, from biggest hermit crab to smallest crab, all waiting for the gay for Cinderella to come and find the shell that's just right. And you know what happens? When it finds the bigger shell and someone finally gets into it, then all of the crabs, in order, in succession, exchange shells so everybody gets a new home. That is like the most amazing thing I have read in nature. And why do they do this? Yeah, I could take that shell. I could put it on, but it's, it's too big for me. That mantle is, is more than I can bear. That mantle is not for me. It's for another. So I will wait by it and herald to the others. Come, come. Come and see the glory. Come and see if this is for you. And when the right one comes along, the one whom the shell is meant for, they all rejoice that he gets the shell. And an amazing thing happens when you give glory where glory belongs. Everyone is given a gift. And everyone gets to share in the celebration. And everyone receives a new life. When we stop trying to make the glory about us and we give all glory to God, guess what God does with all that glory? He showers us with more reasons to glorify him. Hermit crabs. Hermit crabs. <laughs> That's what it means to step aside for God's glory. To know it's not about you. It's about something bigger. See, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, it says in verse 26, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So Jesus was explaining to his disciples who were jockeying for position, trying to get that big shell, trying to get that glory for themselves, in, in the pale shadow of God's, but still trying to make it about James and John, not the name James, it was James and John. And Jesus says, this isn't the way. It's the way out there, but out there is broken. <coughs> And here, glory is not given to the glory hogs. 
Honor is not given to the arrogant. God sees the humble. God sees the servant. God sees the person who is not doing it for attention, but doing it because it needs doing. They're the ones who are honored and are great in the kingdom. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, and I can't think of a better place to be great, then we must be a servant. And Jesus Christ leads from the front as he always does. For he became a servant of all, a slave to all, and dying for the remission of our sins, so that we could be baptized with more than water, but spirit and fire. And even in that, John the Baptist led the way, and prepared the way, and he didn't make it at all about him, because he died. John the Baptist dies. Go to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I didn't know there was a ringtone for Mark. Mark chapter 6. <laughs> verses 14 through 16. <coughs> King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers had work in him. But others said, He is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now you may not know the story. Uh, John the Baptist, he was uh, preaching righteousness. Herod and his new wife Herodias weren't exactly fulfilling the righteousness of God. And he made no qualms of saying that. To his credit, Herod listened a little bit. He respected John. He knew the people loved him. He was afraid to do anything about John. So he actually took the time to listen. Herodias, not so much. And consequently, she conspired to have the head of John the Baptist placed upon a silver platter. That's where that phrase comes from. And so Herod killed a man he knew to be righteous for expedient political and marital reasons. And consequently, John the Baptist died for righteousness' sake. But what we may not realize is that in this quote, John the Baptist's death, even that is being used for the glory of God. God and pointing to Christ. For after all, this is now when Christ is really coming to his own and people are talking about the name of Jesus and everyone is talking about the name of Jesus and people are trying to figure out who he is. No one can accept Jesus for Jesus. Do you ever notice that? No one's like, well, he's just Jesus. No, he's got to be someone else. They're thinking, oh, maybe he's Elijah, that Elijah we've been waiting for. They don't think he's the Messiah. They think he's the guy that's supposed to come before the Messiah comes. There's a little bit of funniness right there. They think he's the one who John the Baptist was fulfilling with the spirit of, but ultimately comes down to what do they believe? They believe that no, it's not Jesus. They believe that it's John the Baptist raised from the dead and even in his death. He's preparing people for the belief and the power of the resurrection. That you can't keep a righteous man down. And when a righteous man is killed unrighteously, God will raise him from the dead and you will see the power and glory of God. He was born for him. He lived for him. He worked for him. And even his death wasn't about himself. Even his death was about his cousin Jesus. A six month head start to prepare the world for Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist impeccably, miraculously did the work that God made him. And John the Baptist would be the very first person to say, Kevin, hush up about it. Stop talking about me. Because it was always about Jesus. So, beloved, how are we going to point to Christ? What are we going to do in our lives? How are we going to dedicate the new life given us to serve our Jesus? Our Jesus who is worthy of every moment, every breath that he gives to us. Every dime in our bank. Every opportunity, every love and relationship that we receive. All these things, all these gifts, all these abundant blessings of God. How will we use them to tell the story? It's not our story. It's his story. Because he is my story. His glory, his gospel, his resurrection, his steadfast love. That's my story. 
How are we going to make our life about Him? That's the choice each and every one of us has. I can't answer your how. Only you can. In listening to the call of God, to the purpose for which you were made. That you can say your joy is complete, is fulfilled, and the service rendered to the God who made you. It's doing amazing. In World War II, there was a Marine uh, major by the name of Joe Foss. Joe Foss was a fighting ace, a, an amazing pilot. All right? He was capable of uh, shooting down uh, Japanese planes during the Guadalcanal campaign in the Pacific Theater, amazingly so much so that he was placed in charge of an entire squadron that was named Foss's Flying Circus. Foss's Flying Circus was responsible for shooting down 72 Japanese planes, 26 of which directly attributed to Joe himself. All right, He was a, a very aggressive, up-close fighter when people were trying to keep their distance and an uncanny gunner. As a consequence of that, when he tied and reached the 26th mark, which was uh, the record that was set uh, in uh, World War I, he was called America's first ace of aces. Consequently, he had an amazing career. Um, afterwards, uh, they even put him on the cover of Life magazine, much to Joe's chagrin. But then he went on to do wonderful things. After he retired, he became a brigadier general in the Air National Guard, became the president of the NRA, the 20th governor of South Dakota, the first commissioner of the AFL, and he even went on to be a television broadcaster. He led an amazing life of many accomplishments. And then shortly before his death in 2003, he was on his way to West Point for a speaking engagement, where he was detained in Phoenix, Arizona, by the TSA because of what he had in his pocket. They were afraid that sharp metal object could be used as a weapon. Now, Mr. Foss, being a veteran, he wasn't really upset by the detainment. He understood that they were just doing their job. He understood as a military man that security was important. So he wasn't bothered by that. And he wasn't bothered that they didn't know who he was. All right, let me get a shortcut. If anyone ever says, do you know who I am? That situation isn't going to work out well no matter what. Right? It just doesn't end well for anybody. Because one, clearly, no, we don't. So you're not as high an object as you think you are. And two, even if you were, apparently it wouldn't matter. All right? But Joe was in no way like that at all. He wasn't bothered that he was detained. He wasn't bothered that they didn't know who he was. He said the only thing that bothered him is they didn't know that what he was carrying in his pocket was the Congressional Medal of Honor. Not because he had earned it. Not because it was handed to him by FDR personally. Not because of what he accomplished to gain it. The medal itself, what it meant. Even during the height of the post 9-11 patriotism and the need, it meant that our culture had shifted so much that the highest honor that could be given was no longer publicly honored as be recognized. Football stars, even he was the president of the NFL. Football stars are recognized. Rap stars are recognized. Over in England, they knight musicians and actors. The people who give their all, who risk their all, to do amazing things that matter and have value and change and save lives. What we say we honor is no longer publicly recognized. Sure. Pointed five medal star. It was a medal of honor. And of all the people that you would be concerned as a threat to national security, not only would Joe Foss not be on the top of that list, all right, but a Congressional Medal of Honor winner who already gave so much for this country. He wasn't bothered that they didn't know who he was. It's not about Joe, a kid from Sioux Falls. It was about the medal. John the Baptist doesn't care if you know his name. John the Baptist doesn't care if you know the works that he did. John the Baptist doesn't care if you remember or have read the scant few scraps of his sermons that are preserved in the scriptures. John the Baptist doesn't care about John the Baptist. John the Baptist dedicated his entire life that you would care about Jesus Christ. That you would care about the gospel worth living for and worth dying. Right now, having spent 
thousands of years in eternity. John the Baptist still only cares that more of us join him there than where he is, Christ is. <clears throat> John the Baptist says, I'm not the guy. Man, I want to introduce you to the guy. I want you to see him and know him. I want you to see him as I see him. I want you to love him as I love him. And beloved, if that isn't our mindset, what are we even doing it for? If we don't cherish what the gospel has done in our lives so much that we can't contain it anymore, but we have to share it, then do we cherish it? I guarantee you, if you get a cherry red Thunderbird, you're going to be telling everybody about that car. I guarantee you, if you get a diamond ring, you're going to be showing everybody that ring. We have been given eternity, love, meaning, purpose, value. How much do we care about? Who are we telling about? How are we showing the joy we should have because of it? Because beloved, they need it too. And we know firsthand they need it too. So beloved, put your mind on Christ. And stop worrying about whatever bits of glory the world keeps having us chase after as we just wind up chasing our tails. Keep up with the Joneses. And let's chase after what we have attained because it was given to us. Let's chase after the glory of God and make it about Him. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your provision and your care. We thank you for your love, Almighty One. And we ask God that you make us passionate for you. We ask God that we see the honor and glorifying you alone. And we see the goodness and the work that we get to do for you. And what it means, Lord, to quietly dedicate our life and our purpose to letting people know your name. We ask, Lord, that you charge us with the same spirit of John the Baptist that you already placed in our heart. But, Lord, give us the attitude of John that we may share your name with them that need to hear it. And Lord, last night I checked out is why did God ever buy So Lord, as you did for Zechariah, open our mouth, loosen our tongue, and let us bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.